Next and last paper, Corporate Taxation and Carbon Emissions, Luigi Urbino will present. Hopefully the slides will pop up. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there is a superior thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so thanks a lot for uh, organizing these and putting the paper on the program. And uh, you can see that, uh, how do you use a cool thing? <laughs> No, now that kind of what I want to use it, yeah. I to, I to watch you guys using it all this time. So uh, you can see that this paper was, uh, um, the idea came up during COVID since we were all stuck in a room. And uh, uh, so um, the, the co uh, co um, carbon emissions uh, uh, seems to be, uh, uh, reducing carbon emissions seems to be a big uh, and important first story goal in the next, uh, uh, come in the coming years and politicians uh, uh, seems to have taken notice. So what we ask in this paper is um, if we look at the corporate tax code as it is right now, and in particular, I'm gonna show you evidence from the US, is there an implicit um, uh, bias, environmental bias in corporate taxation? In other words, is it true that uh, uh, more polluting firms uh, tend to pay lower taxes? And if yes, uh, through which mechanism? You can imagine that the answer is yes. We find, I'm going to show you the empirical uh, evidence. And uh, it seems to be uh, this uh, implicit subsidy seems to be uh, sizable uh, in the order of five, eight dollars per ton of carbon. I will try to quantify it in a more precise way. And uh, it works now. How does it work? It works indirectly through the tax shield of debt. In other words, uh, tax code allows corporations to deduct interest expenses from uh, the tax base. Once after showing this uh, in, the, in the data, I will, uh, we will build a general equilibrium model, which is going to be, uh, um, I would say, fairly rich. So it's going to be a gross economy, but it's going to have lots of taxes, uh, debt and equity choice, uh, and there's going to be four uh, input-output networks uh, uh, along the lines of what Ian just uh, described. And finally, so we're going to use this model to run counterfactuals. In the paper, I've said a counterfactual, at least I plan to have said a counterfactual to revise the draft. But for sure, in the presentation, I'm going to show the most obvious one. Suppose I remove, we remove the tax shield of that. How much, how big an effect we get in terms of GDP, consumption, but also uh, uh, carbon emissions. Now, the empirical analysis. Uh, I have a whole slide on data which is full because we combine different databases. And in particular, we need data from on firms which we get from CompuStat America, uh, North America. Uh, we need the important data uh, base, is the uh, important data we need is data on emissions. So we purchase this uh, proprietary data set, which is true cost, which has data on emissions of this uh, big, no, I would say, is fairly representative of CompuStat. I mean, there is a nice coverage with overlap with CompuStat, which has increased over time, in particular since the last uh, few years. And uh, it gives you emissions by its firms. And uh, uh, if you don't have the emissions reported by the firms, they use some models to compute the emissions that these firms uh, 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 make. Then we have, uh, we try to be very careful with the tax rates. So we have statutory tax rates. We need to know the locations of the establishments of the firms. We, for multinationals, we need to know the breakdown of sales uh, in different countries to compute the right tax rates and, uh, and so on. And finally, PA data will be used to calibrate the input output networks. Now, let me give you the main specification. So I am gonna run versions of the regression you see there. On the left hand side, you have taxes over sales. These are taxes paid by corporations. And uh, on the right hand side, you have carbon, the true cost measure I told you, over sales. And then there is some control. So the important control here, the one I uh, tend to stress, is this <laughs> profits uh, uh, control. Okay, so uh, we're gonna control to be precise for EBITDA. Now, EBITDA. So then, uh, before showing you the uh, estimate, the results of this uh, regression, let me point out that I'm not interpreting this data in any causal way. So I'm not sure, I'm not saying that if you emit more carbon, you're gonna pay lower taxes like this. Okay. I'll just okay, let me let me show you what I get. I find now you see in this table the beta coefficient is negative and uh, which is significant. 
and uh, across all specifications, I would say it's fairly stable, and also when you control for the controls I showed you before, that would be the second column, you see that it is still true that there is a negative association between the taxes, the, corporate, the income taxes that firms pay, and the uh, carbon emissions. Now, how can we get a little bit more details over this? So, how about the following? I take the following taxes, so this, remember this is the left hand side variable, and I divide it in these two parts. One part is to say taxes, uh, I, to these taxes I add a measure of what I call the tax shield. So it's like, suppose, remember that firms can deduct interest expenses from the tax base, suppose I re-add these interest expenses to the taxes they pay. So you see it's taxes plus interest payments by the firms times the tax rate. Tax rate, we have to be careful to compute what's the effective tax rate that firms face. We try to do our best. And then I subtract. Now I'm going to run the regression you saw before on each component separately. You see that when I run, that's the first three columns, the same regression. But now I take these taxes plus uh, tax shield uh, together, the correlation uh, disappears. Whereas if I just focus on the tax shield, uh, the second part, so the, the, the last three columns, I get the same uh, significant regression uh, uh, data, but with the opposite sign and the same magnitude as the, as, the, as the original one. Now, let me further break down this regression, this uh, effect. So now I'm going to focus on tax shield. And tax shield can be broken down into three components. So tax rate, and then interest payments itself given by debt, and interest rate, interest rate paid, average interest rate paid by the firm on different types of debt the firm has and the debt of the firm. And again, if you run this regression but with these variables, the three variables on the left hand side, you see that most of the variation, I would say all the correlation, the significance of the correlation is captured only by debt. In other words, it seems that dirty firms pay lower taxes, but they also have higher leverage, higher debt for some reason. Finally, let me ask myself, let me ask, why, do, why is it the case that these firms have more leverage? Well, perhaps not surprising for you, but these firms tend to have higher PPE, which is the tangible, a measure of tangible assets. So it turns out that the PPE is the one measure that kills the correlation, so it explains all the, vari all the significance of the relationship. And this is just, uh, you see, I just add PPE over sales, in different uh, uh, specifications here, but if I, were, if I had the time to click on the button, you could see that even if you control for a bunch of stuff, it is still the case that PP over sales is the variable that is all the correlation. So to sum up, we want to suggest that dirty firms seems to be firms with more tangible assets, seems to be firms with higher debt, seems to be firms that can deduct more interest expenses, so they pay less on their um, when they when they they rent the capital, so the, the, the cost of capital for them is going to be lower because a bigger chunk of this cost of capital can be deducted from taxes. This is a visual uh, uh, representation of what I just said. So it's one step, one by one, all the steps. But I'm showing you the regression. Now uh, the model. Um, so how much time do I have? Eleven. More, more than ten. Yeah. Okay. So. The model is, uh, uh, I would say, rich, but mostly from the corporate side. So the household side is relatively standard. So there's going to be a representative household that's going to consume and supply labor. Consumption is a Cobb Douglas, so this is Cobb Douglas meets Dixie Stiglitz. Cobb Douglas across sectors is going to be 56 sectors in the calibration. And each sector is going to be the consumption good of each sector is going to be a bundle of differentiated goods produced by a continuum of firms. The reason why I need Dixie Stiglitz within a sector is because I also want to have a markup. So notice that the second aggregator over there has sigma i, so the elasticity of substitution is going to be is going to allow to be sector specific. Okay, and. Um, all right, so then have consumption taxes, labor income taxes, the household supplies labor, and uh, the investment. Well, the household is allowed to invest in three types of assets, risk-free government debt, risky corporate bonds, and equity, which is also risky. 
To be precise and for simplicity, I'm not going to do here systematic risk. So it's only going to be uh, idiosyncratic risk. Okay, and uh, we, it's not so hard to extend the model. We want to keep the closed form tool. Now, the representative firm. So each sector is going to have a continuum of firms. But if you do the math, you can define a representative firm. So I'm going to talk about the firm of sector I, so firm I. Well, the firm is owned by consumers, maximizes the PDP of dividends, using the stochastic discount factor of the consumers, but there is no aggregate risk, so that's easy. <coughs> then there is, a, a, it can issue risky corporate bonds, risky because I'll tell you in a second. It can hire labor, it will hire labor. Now, the first network, it will purchase intermediate goods, meaning goods from all other sectors in the economy. That's the first uh, input output network. In addition, the firm can buy different types of capital. So there's going to be, in fact, three types of capital here. Structures, equipment, and intangible capital. Each type of capital is itself produced through another network. So there's going to be four networks, one for the intermediates, and three for the uh, capital. Why are we so rich here? Well, because capital, tangible capital matters. And because also electricity, it could be very essential. So you see, I need to be, uh, I, I, I thought this was a, a good idea. So, and uh, the, how we calibrate these networks, the capital network, we use this uh, paper by Lynn and Winberry that uh, has a very nice uh, theory of this investment network. Finally, called others. We choose production function to be called Douglas, although we relax it in the extensions. And uh, uh, firms pay a profit tax. Crucially, it's allowed, firms allowed to deduct something from the profit tax. In particular, it's going to be a tax shield of that. Now, how are emissions produced? Emissions are equal to some emission, sector-specific emission rate, which is EI times the production of the firm. So it's a very simple uh, model of emissions here. You produce more, you emit more in this linear, which is sector specific. OK. Now, one thing I have to tell you is why is it the case that debt and equity are risky? Well, I need to introduce some form of default. But at the same time, I want to keep tractability and have some flexibility when I calibrate the model. So I'm going to have the simplest possible uh, theory of default. Every billion, a random fraction of firms, is selected to be in the vote. Of this fraction, a subfraction is restructured. In that case, the equity holders are wiped out. The debt holders recover their investment. So, I mean, they can continue. Whereas, the, in the, the other fraction of firms in each period is liquidated, meaning both equity holders and debt holders lose everything. Now, you see that as a result, in equilibrium, debt is going to be risky, and equity is going to be riskier than that. Uh, we're going to calibrate these to, yeah, that's right. Finally, I want that to be related to tangible assets or to assets in general. That's why I'm going to assume that the amount of debt that the firm can do is going to be bounded by this linear function, so it's a leverage constraint, a power constraint, of the assets, the capital the firm owns. Notice that psi, the pledgeability parameter, is allowed to be sector-specific and capital-specific. So in particular, uh, more tangible capital will allow the firm to borrow more. Now, let me give you an intuition for why we're going to get the results that I haven't shown yet. <laughs> so what's going to happen here in the one single counterfactual I will show you, I will remove the tax shield of that. As a result, what's going to happen is that Firms, where well, the cost of producing things will be higher, well, the cost of using capital will be higher, the cost of producing things will be higher, the demand will go down, the, pro the production will go down, and as a result, emissions will go down, because emissions are proportional to output. Now, I can actually break down what I just said, I can prove it formally up, in, up, to, a, up to a first order, so I can take a derivative. And this is true, what I'll show you, in partial equilibrium, then we also have general equilibrium effects, and in steady state. Now, what happens when I remove the tax shield? The user cost of capital goes up. And in particular, the user cost of capital is proportional to the uh, pledgeability parameter. The more tangible capital you have, the more you can deduct interest expenses. As a result, you are paying a lower user cost. Now, this user cost goes up more. Uh, as the user cost goes up, 
it turns out that the cost of producing, the marginal cost of producing things goes up. And by how much does this go up? Well, it depends how much capital of type S you're using in the first place. That's the second effect. Uh, now, remember that because of this Stiglitz, I have that price equals constant markup times marginal cost. So as the marginal cost goes up, this is what I showed you now, what I'm telling you now, because the markup is constant, this will pass through one for one onto the price. So the final effect to get the output change is to compute how the price translates into change in output through the elasticity of demand. So to sum up, when I remove that shield of death, the firms most affected are the firm with a higher pleasurability parameter and the firms that use more capital in the first place. Uh, in fact, you can actually show that this formula simplifies a lot if you allow structures and equipment to have the same pleasurability parameter. In that case, you can have the formula for dy, d log y, is proportional to PP over sales, which in our case is the total of structures plus equipment, which is what I showed you in the, in the regression. Now, uh, calibration, um, again, we try to be uh, precise <laughs> as much as we can. In particular, we use the exact head algebra, so which is popular in uh, trade theory. So we calibrate the model of an existing equilibrium, right? And uh, uh, we, the thing, important thing, I guess, here is linear wind value to calibrate the investment network. And we also show robustness, I'm not going to show it to you, but robustness uh, uh, um, uh, analysis around these uh, parameters. Now, uh, okay, let's remove the tax shield of that. So what happens, uh, when you do that, it turns out that uh, GDP goes down. I mean, this is increasing taxes, okay? Removing tax shield is increasing taxes. This is in steady state. Eh? Consumption also goes down, but goes down less than, than output because there is less capital in the economy. Firms disinvest uh, uh, capital. Finally, total emissions fall more, proportionally more, in fact, 5% vis-a-vis 2% than GDP. Why? Because this policy is affecting the dirty firms more than green firms. So there is a correlation between the user cost of capital that goes up and the uh, uh, emissions that, uh, that the firm is, uh, is making. And this is a pretty large number. I can actually break it down sector by sector. I have 56 sectors, but I'm showing you the six most polluting sectors, which account for, if I'm not mistaken, 85% of total emissions. And uh, uh, um, uh, these different things is also, I can, not only I can show you the effect on each sector, I can show you the effect on each input. You see, not surprisingly, each sector reduces the amount of capital it uh, uh, uses. Now, you're all thinking, what about a carbon tax? So how does this compare to a carbon tax? I can uh, also introduce a carbon tax in the model, which in our case will be uh, uh, tau E times the emission, which I remind you are proportional to the two output. It turns out that if you want to introduce a carbon tax, it asks the following question, can I get the same reduction in emissions as the country factor I just had, well, you will need a carbon tax of $23, which is pretty large, I guess, relative to zero. <laughs> but, uh, but then you say, how come uh, this is so big? Well, no, well, uh, is it really the same thing? Well, the carbon tax is better, as you can imagine, than the tax shield, because the carbon tax is more precise, it's more directed to the dirty firms. And in fact, the corresponding reduction in output is uh, minus 1.31% as opposed as the 2% you saw before. I can also show you the uh, effect on each single sector, but I guess I, I'm done. So we, uh, what we show in this paper is that there is a large environmental bias in corporate taxation, which works through the, uh, um, this uh, tax shield of uh, debt. We study several counterfactuals, I showed you only one, and we show in this counterfactual that uh, a policy that removes the tax shield of debt has a disproportional, disproportionate effect on polluted sectors and therefore a large impact on emissions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Luigi. The discussion is at the end All right, so thank you so much to the organizers for inviting me to discuss this very interesting paper.
Let me start with a brief summary of what the paper does. So the main idea behind the paper is as follows. Let's assume that we have some dirty firms, so firms that pollute a lot. Now those dirty firms, uh, they tend to have higher asset tangibility. Okay, that makes a lot of sense, right? They have all those factories, they have all those physical capital that generates a lot of pollution. Now, given that they have higher asset tangibility, uh, this also implies that they have more collateral, and so potentially uh, they can better rely on debt financing uh, in their capital structure. Okay, so therefore we expect those firms to have higher leverage. Now, since they have a higher leverage, uh, they're going to have higher debt tax sheets. Okay, so this is mechanical. If you have a lot of debt, you're going to have very high interest expense, and to the extent that you can deduct the interest expense from your taxable income, that's going to reduce your taxes. Okay, so therefore there are good reasons to expect that those firms, they will be able to pay lower taxes. Accordingly, and this is the, the main hypothesis of the paper, uh, due to the tax advantage of debt, dirty firms might very well end up paying lower taxes. Okay? And if so, uh, this would very much suggest that corporate taxes actually subsidize pollution, okay? which is the, the main argument in the paper. Now, in order to shed light on this question, uh, the authors use data on US public firms from 2004 until 2019. Accounting data are standard computed data, and to capture emissions, they use data from true cost. Then in terms of the reduced form evidence, this is as simple as it can get. Okay, so essentially the run regression of taxes paid on carbon emissions at the firm level. Okay, and what they find when they run these, these very simple regressions is that indeed uh, you get a coefficient that is negative and significant, which implies that those firms that pollute more, they tend to pay lower taxes. Okay, so consistent. Uh, with the main hypothesis in, in the paper. And then in the second part of the paper, uh, what they do is they embed their reduced form estimates into a G model, and then they show that when they run this counterfactual in which we eliminate the tax advantage of debt, uh, essentially this reduces carbon emissions by more than it would reduce aggregate output. Okay, so accordingly, uh, they conclude that a simple policy that removes the tax shields of debt can substantially reduce carbon emissions. Okay, so in a nutshell, this is what the, the paper does. Now, in terms of my discussion, I'm going to focus on five main comments that I have for, for the authors. So the, the first comment will be pertaining to a recent change in the tax treatment of the interest expense, which I believe could be quite useful in the context of the paper. Then I'll talk about the empirical relevance of the debt tax shields. Uh, I'll talk about the, the policy implications. I'll talk about the measurement of the key variables. And then I will conclude with some miscellaneous comments. All right, so let me start with my first comment pertaining to the tax advantage of debt. So in the paper, the authors assume that we have full tax deductibility of the interest expense, okay, which is not quite correct. I mean, strictly speaking, uh, this is only true until the end of 2017. Okay, so until 2017, uh, there was indeed full tax deductibility, meaning for each dollar of interest expense that you have, you can deduct it one to one from the taxable income. And then there was a massive change in 2018. Okay, so ever since 2018, uh, we only have limited tax deductibility. So what happened? Well, this guy happened. <laughs> okay, so when he was president, he made a lot of changes, and in particular, he, he made a lot of adjustments to the, to the tax code. Okay, so that was the, the tax reform of December 22nd, 2017, and one of the provisions of the reform was this, this massive reduction in the tax advantage of tax. Okay, so just to be more specific, uh, what the, the reform did uh, was to limit the interest expense deduction to 30% of the EBITDA as of 2018. And then as of 2022, this is even more restrictive because you have a cap at 30% of the, the EBIT, okay? so which is a very substantial reduction in this tax advantage of, of debt. Now, the key point is that in the paper, the authors don't really take into account this 2017 reform, okay? so, which I think is kind of a missed opportunity, uh, because in a sense, uh, this reform provides almost the, the perfect natural experiment in order to study how the tax advantage of debt can potentially affect emissions. I mean, ultimately, the reason why they put together this big G model with all the machinery is precisely in order to be able to run this counterfactual in terms of what happens if we reduce the tax advantage of, of debt. Okay, but in a sense, this reform did occur. It occurred in 2007. Okay, so accordingly, this, this will be my first suggestion to the author. 
uh, I think it would be really interesting to, to explicitly consider this 2017 reform as a natural experiment in this context. And then the authors could use the, the estimates from, from this analysis in order to discipline the, the model. And of course, the model will still be very insightful, right, in order to examine this more extreme kind of factual in which the tax advantage of debt uh, would be fully removed. Okay, but I do think that, you know, there are a lot of cool stuff that the authors could do uh, with this uh, specific episode. And my second comment pertains to the empirical relevance of the debt tax shields. So in the model, the authors assume that leverage decisions are driven by debt tax shields and default probabilities, okay, which is essentially the setup of the trade-off theory of capital structure. Now, in practice, we know that the, the debt tax shields are not the main considerations uh, pertaining to capital structure decisions. Okay, so we look at the, the CFO survey of uh, Graham and Harvey, when they ask CFOs, you know, well, what, is, what is really first order when you set the capital structure of your firm? Uh, what they find is that that actually is only criterion number seven. Okay, so interestingly, the, the, the number one criterion is actually the need to maintain financing flexibility. Okay, so it seems like CFOs, they don't want to increase leverage too much because there is a risk that they're going to lose flexibility to quickly invest into great NPV projects that, that come their way. Uh, relatedly, uh, in their JFE paper, Haider and Bloomquist find only mixed sub empirical evidence that firms tend to adjust leverage following changes in taxes. Okay, so they find some action following tax increases, but not so much following tax decreases. Okay, so therefore the bottom line is that in light of the empirical literature, uh, the model might be overstating the relevance of debt tax shields for capital structure decisions. Okay, so this leads to my second suggestion. So I think it would be helpful uh, to consider a version of the model in which there are also other costs of debt financing. Like, for example, if you increase debt, you might potentially uh, lose some flexibility going forward. Okay, this is something that may allow for a more realistic formulation of capital structure decision, but at the same time, this may not be innocuous for the model, right? Because this might very well attenuate uh, the role of the tax shields and potentially affect the, the quantitative analysis. Okay, but I think this would be interesting to also consider uh, this type of aspects uh, because this is potentially something that could be relevant in, in this context. Okay, and it's true that the, the, the results are kind of robust to, to this type of consideration. Then my third comment pertains to the policy implications. So the paper kind of abstracts away from carbon taxation as a policy option. Okay, and the, the rationale that is provided in the paper is kind of a very pragmatic rationale. Okay, so this is what they write uh, at the beginning of the paper that in practice, currently only 20% of global carbon emissions are covered by some form of climate change regulation. Now certainly the focus on corporate uh, income tax is very interesting. Okay, so there is no concern there. Uh, but at the same time, this is perhaps less informative from a policy perspective, right? Because from a policy perspective, ideally, we want to consider the entire menu of tax instruments that are available. And sure, I mean, it is true that uh, there is no carbon tax in the U.S., but at the same time, there are several U.S. states that have carbon tax type policies, okay, such as the, the cap and trade policy in California. And recent work has shown that this is something that significantly affects firm behavior. Okay, so here, if the authors want to go this route and kind of study this, this interaction between those two different tools, uh, they could potentially use state-level data uh, to examine this interaction. Okay, so ultimately, I mean, when it comes to, to policy considerations, uh, for me, what is always kind of the, the ultimate criterion is suppose you go to DC and you talk to policymakers. And then the question is, what would you tell policymakers? Okay, so here in this context, it, it seems a little bit like a stretch that you know, if you go to DC and talk to them, you cannot really start by saying, oh, let's assume we live in a world where there is no possibility to use corporate tax, uh, to use carbon taxation. Okay, so that's probably something that's not going to fly. I mean, it's going to be hard to formulate recommendations purely based on the corporate income tax. Okay, this is the spirit of my third suggestion. Uh, I think the, the paper, I mean, the paper does a bit of that as a benchmark towards the end of the paper, but I think it would, it would bring a lot of value to also explicitly <coughs> consider the role of carbon taxation, uh, at least in the discussion of the policy implications of the paper. Then comment number four, uh, pertaining to the measurement of carbon emissions. So in the paper, the authors use emission data from true cost. Okay, and there, there is some caveat here, and the, the big caveat is that these data are either self-reported by the firms, or imputed by true cost. Okay, if you talk to people working in ESG, uh, they kind of don't really like this true cost data set. Okay, and the reason is that we don't actually know what is the secret source that they use in order to do the imputation. And then there are some concerns that you know potentially uh, these are data that don't really capture the actual emissions of, of the firm. And so here what I would recommend to do is to uh, also use some alternative data sources uh, that would directly capture uh, actual emissions. And so, for example, the authors could use the, the TRI data from the EPA that, that, that have been used in several recent articles. 
Okay, so that would be my suggestion number four, uh, to use actual emission data as opposed to imputed slash self-reported data. And then my final set of comments are, are a set of miscellaneous points which are you know, more technical in nature, okay, and I have three of such points. So the, the first one pertains to the scaling of the main variables. So in the paper, everything is scaled by sales. Okay, when they compute emissions, this is emission over sales, leverage is debt over sales, asset tangibility is PPN over sales. Uh, this is a bit unusual. I mean, what would be more natural uh, is to use assets as scaling variable, right? I mean, especially for the last two items, when, when you think about leverage, I mean, the usual definition of leverage is that we want debt over assets, right? Because it tells us what is the fraction of your assets that are actually financed by, by debt. Okay, and similarly for, for PPE, I mean, for, for asset tangibility, uh, here PPE of your assets would convey this kind of this intuition that, you know, what is the fraction of your assets that are actually tangible. Okay, so here, uh, that would be my suggestion number five, to consider using assets instead of sales as scaling variable. Then the, the, the second mysterious point refers to the, to the treatment of the state taxes. Okay, and so here that's going to be a very nerdy comment, but you know, this is something that, uh, that might nevertheless be helpful in the context of the paper. So when they, the, the authors account for, for state taxes, okay, and for the possibility that you know, there, are, there are many firms in the sample that actually operate in multiple states, uh, what they do is they use the following apportionment formula. Well, essentially, they assume that you know, when, when, when companies have to pay taxes in different states, essentially the, the, the share of taxes that, that, that will apply in a given state depends on the share of employment and sales that the company has in the state, uh, weighted 50-50. Now, it turns out that this is not quite the correct formula. I mean, the, the, the relevant formula that is used is the one that you see here, where this is not just the share of employees and sales, but in fact the share of payroll, property, property and sales that you have in the state, weighted by the so-called apportionment factors. Okay, and there are three of them, uh, the payroll, property and sales apportionment factors, and all those things are state-specific. Okay, and many states use one-third each, but you also have states that use like, you know, 50% on sales or even 100% on sales. Okay, so there is a lot of heterogeneity out there, and this is something that, you know, uh, should be taken taken into account when you compute this uh, specific aspect of the tax burden. Okay, so that would be suggestion number six, uh, to use the relevant apportionment formula to compute state taxes. And then my final point pertains to the analysis of private firms. So in a robustness check, the authors look at private firms. Uh, but here you have to be very careful because, you know, some of those private firms, they're going to be S corporations. And according, they don't even pay the, the corporate tax. Okay, so therefore here one thing that the authors could do uh, is to use those firms, instead of a robustness, use those firms as a placebo test. Okay, that would, mean, uh, would be my final suggestion, that in the test using private firm, uh, you should make sure to exclude those firms that are not C corporations, right, because they are not subject to the corporate income tax, and then if there are sufficiently many of those firms, you can actually use that to your advantage so that you can put together uh, a nice placebo test. All right, so that's all I have uh, for the author. So overall, this is, you know, super important, super interesting question. And this is a nice paper, which is well worth reading. Thank you very much. Thank you, Xavier. Luigi, you so, want to take some questions? Yes, I uh, also don't mind if there is a minute, because these are great suggestions, and uh, go for it. some of them we already answered. So the thing about Trump, uh, yes, don't tell my voters that uh, it didn't appear in the presentation. It turns out that uh, we do check what happens after the Trump reform. Unfortunately, the data we use is from 2004 to 2018, so it's only one year that we have, I think, after this reform. But we see the effect, like the correlation goes down by, and the tax shield goes down. Like, you, you know, the correlation just showed you exactly by the amount that you would expect. So that uh, is the test you want to say. So it's good that Trump did that, so maybe he did some good that uh, he removed this correlation uh, from, uh, from data. But then the other thing about the carbon tax, you're right, now that's why I presented at the end, the carbon tax is not in the draft yet. But the idea here in the paper would be like just was to quantify this implicit subsidy. And there are policies that are more targeted to reduction of carbon emissions. And uh, uh, but you're right that it would be nice to, you know, uh, to, which is what I was trying to do to compare uh, now the effects in terms of reduction of emissions and reduction in output, but also welfare effects of one policy versus the other. This uh, I agree with you. We'll make it into the, the paper scaling by assets. That's the other thing I just thought about. We did, we did it, and then we. we the, the results were similar, we went for sales. And the reason why we went for sales is that when I show you the first order approximation, so this is the model. The model told us, you know, assets divided by sales in, in the model. 
So we said, okay, let's go there. So there is a nice correspondence. But if you think it's better to do assets, maybe uh, in the empirical part, or at least to show that the result doesn't change, I can see that. Yeah, so. Um, all right. Uh, questions? Yes, please. So three quick things. So one is kind of related to Xavier's point. Yes. Um, so I, along the same lines, what does the model predict for that relationship, you know, for that beta, that linear relationship you had between oh, uh, yeah. intensity and taxes, and can the model kind of quantitatively match what you find in the data? Um, the, kind of an alternative to Xavier's experiment. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. We found, uh, because we calibrate the model using industry data, not firm's data, we get a little bit higher number. <laughs> Uh, uh, for the tax shield. So in the tax shield, it was like five. Now it's like eight in the model. Uh, but it's more noisy because uh, I don't have, uh, I don't use all the data points we, we have. Yeah. Second question quickly. So the what about the, dep the depreciation tax shield? I thought like one, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, one no, no, very no. natural thing here is that yeah, 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 these models no, no. have a lot of so uh, I mean, because we, the reason why we didn't focus on that is because the correlation disappears when you put tax shield. Uh, uh, when you put the tax shield, the measure we cost, of tax shield we construct. Okay, so I said, okay, that's it. But you're right, I can tell you several things about bonus depreciation. That's exactly what you're saying. So, uh, yes, it would work exactly in the same way in the model. Uh, the formula would be exactly the same. Uh, the reason why, I guess, uh, the reason why we don't see so much data because maybe these are large firms and we know from, uh, I don't know, speak in my home that uh, you know, mostly you need to have constrained firms to feel the, the importance of the bonus depreciation. But the good news is that it has the same effect. So one way to spin this result is to say it's not just tax shield, it's the tax code in general. So it's tax shield plus bonus depreciation and we pick up the overall effect. So instead of focusing on tax shield, I focus on everything. My last quick question, if yeah. I may. There's an interesting paper by Lauren Cohen which talks about where does the green innovation take place? Oh, yeah. yeah. He has this controversial view that actually it's the brown firms that do all the green innovating. So before we start uh, you okay. know, ab abolishing the corporate interests, taxation, uh, detention, I have something to say, guys, please. Okay. We have to be careful about it. I have something to say, no offense with the paper you cited, but we are trying also to look at innovation. Okay, because we said so far it's just a mechanical effect of output, if you want, but what about innovation? So we have data, or we do R&D to measure innovation, we also do patent data, and we look at tax shield effect, or correlation of patent data with the um, with emission. And it turns out that, uh, uh, sorry, of uh, tax shield and, and innovative firms measured by patents and everything, it turns out that the effect is that the patent firm pay higher taxes. Because of that. So, if you were to remove that shield according to the evidence we found, you should see a bigger, uh, these firms paying lower tax. The more innovative firms would pay lower tax. So maybe that would help them. See what I mean? So, uh, but I don't know. Maybe it goes against the paper. I don't, I haven't, I don't remember the paper. Yeah, I did that. Uh, happy to take the look at it. Yes, yeah, I actually also had a question yeah. about innovation. It was kind of slightly yeah. different because it turns out that your tangibility is actually very important for, you, for what you're doing. So there's another aspect of innovation, which is not just the R&D side, yeah. but it's actually the adoption of the technology, right? So this new, you know, if I want to substitute producing, uh, you know, energy in a different way, yeah. or do I, so how's the tangibility change? So, but that's uh, your channel, right? One thing I did, one thing we did was to focus on the utility sector, which produces the energy here, and we said, what about different firms producing different energy in different ways, right? And we see the pattern in the sense that uh, the polluting firms within the energy sector are also those with more tangible assets. Okay, so yes, wind power is also very tangible. I also talk to some environmental economists to say, okay, yes, wind power is tangible, but maybe, I don't know, coal seems to be a little bit more uh, from that point of view. But at least this is what uh, the correlation is. So we see the same correlation, of course, much more, much noisier because we're focusing on one set. Uh, and the point is very well taken, so, <laughs> so the point about the, the measurement of these things, we want to use CPA data, the only thing is that uh, we have to match it to the top, right, to get the, the, the taxes, so that's why it might take a little bit of time, but uh, it's definitely on, on the list, yeah, because that's data on establishment, whereas we need here this, right? Yes, please. Yeah. How do you think about this interacting with green bonds, and especially like the data that shows so, that? Okay, it's easy. No. no, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, so it tends to be 
like a pretty broad fact that again a lot of the polluters are actually issuing green bonds because they're ah. using them to finance okay. green projects. Green projects. And then that also changes the um, the cost of the rest of their debt structure as well. Yeah. So uh, no. Okay. So then that okay. That's an interesting fact. I've not thought about it. So you would say that this green bond, I see. So, 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 so the so, so, are issuing green bonds to finance the innovation in green activity. Right. So for, yeah. so for example, yeah, I see, I see. So for example, yeah. the fact that you're showing that, yeah. you know, it's the, uh, that the same firms that are emitting a lot also have a lot of debt. Some of that can be coming from the fact yeah, that... Yeah, no, no, I, I see what you're saying. It is a, a phenomenon that's not just in the last few years. So maybe that would help a little bit, okay? But the other thing is that the only answer I have is this innovation uh, correlation I showed you before. The most innovative firms, in fact, innovative in general. We also look at innovative in green patents. Mm -hmm. So we focus on green patents, and there seems to be uh, a, a, a negative... So it's, in any way, so these are firms that pay more taxes because of tax shield. Uh, those that innovate more, and in particular innovate more in green technology. Uh, now, if the brown ones are also issuing more debt, and therefore they are paying lower taxes, and therefore are innovating more in green stuff, yes, I can see that, but you know, the correlation that we got, not shown, are, seem to point in the opposite end. That's the only thing I, I, I can think of right now. Um, okay, great. Please join me in thanking the presenters and discussants. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Thanks to Yale for hosting us. And uh, our next meeting will be in September in Athens, Greece. Uh, here is a great time to be there, so I hope to see you all. And uh, have a great meeting.